Well, grab your Bible, and uh, if you don't have one with you, you can find one in the seat rack there in front of you. We'll have some notes on the screen, and uh, we're in the book of Hebrews tonight. Now, we're going to be in chapter 9, uh, but I want to uh, just remind you of something at the very end of chapter 8. Now, we spent about two weeks, I believe, in chapter 8. And we talked about the new covenant. Do you remember that? Some of the most exciting things that we've learned so far in the book of Hebrews. The better covenant. The new covenant. Uh, The Bible says, but God found fault with what? What did God find fault with? That he had to make a new covenant. Did he find fault with the the old covenant? No. No. He found fault with the people. The old covenant was a good covenant, but it was dependent upon the people's ability to keep it. So God found fault with the people, not the covenant, and said, I'm going to make a new covenant, but it's not going to be like the old covenant. It's going to be new. And we read from the book of Jeremiah, where it was prophesied that the new covenant would be founded on better promises. And we outlined from Jeremiah chapter 31, four things that makes the new covenant better than the old covenant. The new covenant is built on grace, not obligation. The old covenant was obligation. The new covenant is built on grace. The new covenant promises inward change. The out, the old covenant only dealt with the exterior. The new covenant deals with the interior. The new covenant be, uh, promises total revelation. It promises that Jesus is the complete revelation of the Father. Jesus could say to Thomas, he who has seen me has seen the Father. That's the full revelation. And then the new covenant is a covenant of forgiveness and restoration. The old covenant would only cover sin. It would only hide sin. It would only put a temporary covering of the blood of the goats and the calves over God's broken law. But the blood of Jesus shed once for all takes away the sins of the world. Not just covers our sin, but takes it away. And it's a promise of forgiveness and restoration. How many are glad we live in the new covenant? I'm really glad we're on this side of Calvary. I know that sometimes uh, we say that it would have been interesting to live in, you know, the past. Maybe some people would have loved to live in Abraham's day or, uh, you know, some of those great days. Or even people say it would have been great to live on the earth when uh, Jesus was here. I think God wanted us on the earth today so that we can do kingdom business today, but also so that we can walk in all of the promises of God that are for us in in the new covenant. Now, I want to say something at the end of chapter 8 before we get into tonight's teaching that I didn't have time to cover when we concluded last time. Chapter 8, verse 13 says this. So chapter 8, verse 12 ended all the promises of the new covenant. It's a promise of taking away the sins of the world, everything. I will remember their sins no more. Last few words of verse 12. Now, verse 13 In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now, what did he mean by that? He meant that when this new covenant is established, the old covenant is no longer going to be um, viable. He said it's going to be obsolete. It will no longer be in effect. Now, Jesus didn't destroy the law and the prophets. He came, I said, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill the law and the prophets. But when Jesus fulfilled the law, then it became obsolete as a law because we have a new law. You know, when Congress passes a new law, the old law that super, that, that the new one supersedes, the old one becomes obsolete. So the old law is not disrespected, but it is perfected. Hopefully, <laughs> oh, boy, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every time they pass laws in Washington, D.C., they were laws for the better? (laughs) Wouldn't that be wonderful if we were always moving forward? Well, we know in the spiritual realm, God, when he made the new covenant, it was an improvement on the old covenant. So therefore, when the new covenant was established at the cross, remember, it was not established between 
uh, Jesus and the church, just like the Old Testament was established between God and the nation of Israel, we might think the New Testament was founded between Jesus and the church. That, that's not really true because that wouldn't be any more perfect than the Old Covenant because people still fail today just like they failed then. It was a new covenant established between the Father and the Son on the cross. They are the ones that covenanted together to provide for salvation for the sins of man. That's why this covenant can never be destroyed because both of them are incapable of breaking their word. I love that. Both of them are incapable of failing on their end of the bargain. So then you and I get all the blessings without having to fulfill the obligations because Jesus did it all for us on the cross. So he says in verse 13, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now, when the writer said that, when he wrote that, when he spoke it, I'm not sure, of course, by divine revelation, the Holy Spirit would have known, would have the individual writing this, and I have said from the beginning that in my opinion, it was probably not the Apostle Paul, but whoever it was, if it was Apollos, if it was um, one of these other, uh, uh, Luke, whoever it was that wrote the book of Hebrews, did he know what he was really saying? Probably not. Because what happened just a few years, maybe less than 10, six, eight years or so, after the writing to the Hebrews was finished, what happened? A.D. 70, what took place? The Romans came in and they destroyed the whole city of Jerusalem. They devastated everything. That's what Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24, where he said up on the Mount of Olives, looking across the Kindron Valley, looking towards the Temple Mount, he said, I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left upon another. Every one of these stones will all be torn down. That's what Jesus prophesied. Now, they didn't know what that meant, but about 50, 60 years later, in A.D. 70, 40 years later or so, A.D. 70, the Romans came in and they leveled the Temple Mount. They destroyed the Temple. And what happened then to Temple sacrifices when the Temple was destroyed? They stopped. They ceased. There has not been a Temple sacrifice in Israel for over 2,000 years because there can't be a temple there to sacrifice in. So when the writer here said what is old and obsolete is growing old and is ready to vanish away, he's prophesying that the temple is going to be destroyed and that the animal sacrifices, the sacrificial system that they had all through the old covenant, that's going to stop. And I think that God had to stop it or else the people would have continued to worship a function rather than the reality. Right. Isn't that what people often do? People often worship the form rather than the function. People often worship the tradition rather than what the tradition represents. You know, I, I, I gotta be careful here because I, I, I got a lot of material to cover, but a lot of things that are traditions in the church that have no power in them, they have no strength, they started out as good things. That They started out as, as wonderful things. But then they became traditions. They just became ritual. They became people, things that people did without keeping their hearts in it. And then uh, what started out as good became meaningless because now the people were still just involved in the tradition and forgetting what the thing was all about. The writer to um, uh, Paul said to Timothy, in the last days, there will be uh, perilous times and people will become lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, etc., having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And I don't mean to be too strong here on a Wednesday night, but there are still people that go to churches that are dead and there's no life and spirit of God in them. I mean, I, I don't know why you would go to a dead church. Is it just to punch your ticket? Is it just to get your conscience alleviated? How many saw the quote I put up from uh, Pastor uh, Shambach this afternoon? I thought that was powerful. If you don't know who R.W. Shambach was, then you need to have a revelation. Get right with God. Brother, I mean, he could bring that anointing. He had that voice that would make the... How many know what I'm talking about? R.W. Shambach. Oh, man. I, when I was in Bible college, uh, I, show, I, I just shared this this afternoon on social media. And my wife said to me, did you ever go to Hindi's meetings? I said, oh, yeah, I sure did. 
I went to one of his meetings when I was a student in Central Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, and a lady, uh, 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 you, you got to understand him, and I'm not saying this disrespectfully. There was a prayer line, and a lady came up to get prayed for, and I saw him slather her with oil. I mean, he, he, he must have poured a gallon of oil on her, and then he got ready to pray for her. I mean, he, he just, I know the Bible says, put, put no, put, do not put hands on anyone suddenly. I guess that didn't include women. Because, I mean, when he prayed for her, I mean, he, he shook her with the glory of God. And, uh, and, and I believe she was healed. I, I believe miracles took place. But anyway, I, I'm getting off the point here. <laughs> so the temple sacrifices ceased. And so then another question comes up. Well, what does that have to do with Bible prophecy? If there's no temple today in Jerusalem, and if there's no temple sacrifices being offered, what's that have to do with, with Bible prophecy? Well, the Bible prophesies that the temple will be rebuilt. Now, let me ask you a question. You may not want to answer. You might um, say amen at the wrong time. Does the temple have to be rebuilt before Jesus comes back? Okay. Does not have to be rebuilt prior to the catching away, prior to what we would call the rapture, because the Bible says that three and a half years into the tribulation, that Antichrist will dis desecrate the temple. So there will have to be a temple by the three and a half year mark into the tribulation, but it wouldn't have to be a temple built prior to the, if you follow the traditional uh, pre tribulation rapture, seven year great tribulation um, timeline, which uh, I do and most of us probably uh, still do. So the rapture could take place today, even though there's no temple in Jerusalem. But three and a half years from today, the temple could be rebuilt, sacrifices could be reinstituted, and then Antichrist would come in and desecrate the temple. So I just wanted to point that out because I think God had to, had, in, in God's wisdom, in, in God's design, he had to, in foreknowledge, know that this temple had to be destroyed or the people, even though we got Jesus, people would have still been sacrificing cows. Even though we have a cross, people would have still been killing animals because they did that for so long. That was their tradition. That was their ritual. And, and they would have just kept doing it. They, it didn't have any meaning any longer. It didn't have any purpose any longer. They would have just kept doing it out of tradition and out of ritual. So God had to put it into it so people would really understand that which is obsolete in aging is no longer necessary. We no longer have to worry about the type when we've got the reality. We don't have to have to worry about the foreshadowing when we've got the real thing. We don't have to just look forward to it any longer and hope because now the blood of Jesus has been shed once for all to take away the sins of the whole world. So that's the finish of chapter 8. So let's go into chapter 9. Chapter 9, we'll go ahead and pull up our, our notes now. Uh, chapter 9 is on the, the new or the better sanctuary. Um, the, the old covenant, we talked about the new covenant. Now we're going to talk about the new sanctuary. Now, what do I mean by sanctuary? We're going to read verses 1 through 12. We'll get through those in a moment. What do I mean by sanctuary? What, what's a sanctuary? Place. It's a place. It's a place where we worship. It's a place where we meet with God. So he's going to tonight give us this whole comparison between the old sanctuary or the earthly sanctuary and the new sanctuary or the heavenly sanctuary. And a sanctuary is a place where we worship. The old sanctuary in this context would have been the tabernacle that was the portable worship place when they were still in the wandering days. And then when a permanent temple was built on Temple Mount, that became a permanent sanctuary. But both of those are the old sanctuary because it was on earth. It was a, a physical place. It was a, a, a temporary place. And those things were shadows they were pictures, just like the old covenant was a picture of the new covenant was coming. Those, those dwelling places of God's presence. And, and man, 
I don't take time to, to read, but I know you're aware that God's glory came down in those places. I mean, it was the Shekinah glory, the mist, the vapor, the presence of God, a smoke filled the rooms where the, the priests couldn't even stand up the minister because the glory of God was so rich in there. And that was wonderful. But as wonderful as those things were, they were a foreshadowing. They were a future picture of what would happen. And we had a wonderful example right here tonight of when the presence of Jesus came into this room a little while ago and we were worshiping him. We knew that God was here. We knew that God was here. And uh, it wasn't because of the location. It wasn't because of the building. It wasn't because of the furniture. It wasn't because of all the articles like it was in the Old Testament that they had. And we'll talk about the lampstand, the laver, the brazen altar, all those things. It wasn't on all those things because those things were pictures of what was coming. It was now in reality because Jesus was here, because his blood, has been shed his holy spirit is here his presence we have been washed just as they had washed their hands in the labor our minds have been washed with the living water of the word of god so now we've got the reality and it's a tangible thing because we have the real presence of jesus so let's follow the outline number one is what made the old sanctuary inferior so let's just go ahead and I'll go ahead and read all 12 verses, uh, and then we'll go back, and I know we'll reread them, but this will give us the context. Chapter 9. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness, for a tent was prepared. The first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence, it was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tables of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes, but he and he but once a year and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the Holy of Holies is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic of the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings and regulations of the body imposed until the time of reformation. Verse 11, but when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have already come, then through the greater and more perfect tent or tabernacle or sanctuary, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once and for all, into the holy place, not by the means of the blood of goats and of calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption for us. So there's a comparison, the old place of worship and the new place, the temporary place and the permanent place, the, the typographical, the typological place and the, and the fulfillment of the real place, uh, the old dwelling place, the tabernacle and the temple and the new dwelling place. And we'll get to what that is in just a little bit. But what made the old sanctuary inferior? Letter A, what? It was an earthly sanctuary. Verse number one. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. It was earthly. It was physical. It was built by man. The Jewish people, they brought sacrifices. They brought gifts to Moses in the wilderness, and they collected all the materials, and they built it exactly according to the instruction that God revealed to Moses in the book of Exodus because when everything was built exactly like God told them to build it, and a lot of people, I'm sure you're aware, have done great studies 
of all of the typological pictures of the tabernacle, what all the colors represent and all the numbers of the articles and all of the details. It's all very, very rich in meaning. We're not going to dwell into that because that would just take a lot of time. But uh, when everything was built, the glory of God came. But it was still earthly. It was still physical. It was still temporary. Um, it was, if you will, um, weak in a certain way because it, number one, needed a certain amount of repair. I mean, can you imagine the tabernacle putting it up, tearing it down every time the children of Israel moved through the wilderness for 40 years? Put it up, tear it down. Put it up, tear it down. I've, I've put up a few tents in my life. The last time we put up a tent, we put up a 40 by 60 tent out here to do a tent meeting. And I had four or five men from the church that helped me put that tent up. And it was windy. I think Joe was involved in that. And, and there might be someone else. In, we put that tent up in the windstorm. And man, it was tough. I vowed that day, if we ever put up another tent, I'm going to pay to have it put up. <laughs> Paul was a tent maker, not Pastor Coates. <laughs> I'm not a tent maker. I'm a tent payer. I'll just pay somebody to put up the tent. Uh, when we've had tent revivals out at the Glory Ranch, Jeremy did not put up those tents. <laughs> we paid to have those tents uh, put up. Uh, but put it up, tear it down, roll it up. Put it on the donkeys, move it around in the desert, put it up, tear it down, roll it up, move it around. I'm sure they had to have artisans and they had to have craftsmen that had to make repairs. I'm sure that the hides got torn and, and worn and, and it needed a certain amount of repair. Also, it was limited what? Geographically. It could only be at one place at one time. Now, that's obvious, but compare that to the new tabernacle. The new tabernacle is not in one place at one time. It's everywhere because, and I'll go ahead and say this. I was going to hold this as one of my punchlines for later on. But what is the real tabernacle of the presence of Jesus today? You're looking at it. Put yourself in the mirror. You're looking at it. Know you not that you are the temple of God and his presence dwells in you. The apostle Paul says we are the temple of the spirit of the living God that dwells in us. God doesn't want his presence to dwell in a building. Now, I think buildings are important. I thank God that we have this building, and I think we need to take care of this building, and we want it to be functional, and we want it to be useful, but this is not a shrine. Come on. This is, we're not going to worship the furniture in this building. We're not going to worship certain objects in this building. I'll be careful that I'm not trying to be... Uh, terse here, but we're not going to light candles and worship candles. We're going to worship the God who is the light of the world. We're not going to put uh, water in and worship holy water. We're going to worship the God who is living water. We're, we're, and if we anoint with oil, we're, we're not worshiping the oil. We're just representing the oil that represents the Holy Spirit because it's anointing that breaks the yoke. And uh, we want to have a functional facility and we want it to be useful and we want it to be effective, but this is not a shrine. Now, is the presence of Jesus here? Yes, it is. I'm not going to deny that. Sometimes I come in here and I'm the only one in here. And yet Jesus is here. But that doesn't mean that he's more here than he is at my house. It might be that I come in here, I'm just in a tune. I'm in the right attitude. I'm in the right frame of mind. But I can have the same Jesus that I have in this building anywhere else. I can have the same Jesus in my car. I can have this same Jesus in my house. I can have this same Jesus when I'm washing the dishes. And I do wash the dishes. I, I like to wash the dishes periodically. I don't do it all the time, but, but I do. And, and not only do I feel the presence of Jesus when I wash the dishes, I get the blessing of my wife when I wash the dishes. You guys ought to try it sometime. It's a wonderful marriage tool. It, it, it creates revival in your marriage faster than anything you could ever possibly. Take out the trash, guys. Wash the dishes. Clean up around the house. Somebody's shouting in the back there. It, it, it's very, very practical. Okay. Here, I'm getting off topic. But uh, the um, earthly temple was only in one place. It belonged only to the nation of Israel, not to the whole world. 
not to all the human race. So it was inferior because it was earthly. It was inferior because it was a type of something greater. It wasn't what they were waiting for. It was just like temporary. It was just like, you know what I mean by the word type. The word type is, is a concept in Bible study. We see it all the way through the Bible. That means a shadow. That means like a foretelling. That means like a, a deposit that tells you something better is getting ready to come later. So if you've got something that's not the real deal, it's just like the down payment. It's just like the earnest money. If you go to buy a piece of property, you, you could put a contract on the most expensive piece of property in Hernando County. You could probably sign a contract contract and only give them a hundred bucks or so. Does that mean you're going to get that property for a hundred bucks? No, that means that's the down payment. You gave an earnest money because that meant you were seriously concerned about signing the, the contract. Now, is that everything? No, there's a whole lot more yet to come. So the earthly temple was just a type where it was a picture of something greater that would come later. That's in verses two, three, and two, three, four, and five. I'm not going to reread those right now. As I read the whole thing there a while ago. But 2, 3, 4, and 5, uh, well, let me just refer to it. It talks about the, how the tabernacle and the temple were laid out. And I, I was going to try to put up a, uh, a diagram here tonight, but I don't think I got it loaded into the computer. But I know that you've seen what the temple or the tabernacle looked like, the design, the layout, the, the floor plan. If you've never seen it, just... Just Google Old Testament tabernacle and you'll see a picture. It'll pop right up in your phone. And, and uh, there was a, a, a curtain around the outside that was called the court of the Gentiles because they could come to the outside but never come into that curtain. And then there was the holy place. And then inside the holy place, there was the holy of holies. The holy of holies was a, a square Area. I don't remember right now exactly how many feet it was in in dia in uh, width, width and breadth, but it was just as tall as it was wide and long. So it was like a cube, and that was the holy of holies, and that's the place where I read a while ago that only the high priest, and then only once a year, could go into the holy of holies, and he would take the blood of the Passover lamb, and we would put a freshly applied sacrifice on the uh, altar on the mercy seat every year on the day of atonement but uh, all of those were a picture of what was coming later there was the lampstand in there um, there was the table of showbread there was the golden altar of incense all of these things have pictures that we're going to get to tonight if we uh, have time of what they really represented. And then the Holy of Holies, and inside the Holy of Holies uh, was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a box. It was like three and three quarters feet long, two and one quarter feet high, and two and one quarter feet wide. It was a box. It was made out of acacia or shittim wood, but it was covered with gold. And on the top of the ark, and if you've probably seen uh, Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, that, that ark that they have as a movie prop is really pretty accurate. It, it really looks pretty accurate from what I've understood. And on the top of the mercy seat, there's the two angelic beings. They're, they're facing towards each other and their, their arms or their wings are facing towards each other, one on each side. And in that middle area between the outstretched arms of the cherubim, that area is what was called the mercy seat. It was not a place to sit down. The mercy seat was not a place to sit down. The mercy seat was the place where the priest would put the uh, blood sacrifice when he would come in on the day of Yom Kippur. Now, what's really exciting is that inside the Ark of the Covenant, there were several things we read. There was Aaron's rod that budded. You remember that from the book of Exodus? They kept that and they put it in the ark. There were the, the tablets of the Ten Commandments, they, they, the ones that um, Moses came down from the mountain. They took the tablets and they put them inside the ark. And then the scrolls of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible that Moses 
penned when he was on the mountain of the Lord. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the scrolls, they had those inside these, this ark. And that way, whenever they went into battle, they would carry the ark before them. When they had to move the, the uh, tabernacle around, that the ark would be used to, to transport all these things. Now, here's what the, the picture is. Among the other things, the law of God, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deut- Numbers, and Deuteronomy was inside the ark. And God would look down from heaven, he would see his law that man had broken time after time. Man had broken the law of God, broken the Ten Commandments, and God would see that. But on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest would go in there, he would put a fresh blood covering and the word atonement means covering he would put a press application of the passover lamb's blood on the top of the mercy seat and then god looking down from heaven he would no longer see into the ark and see that his law was there that man had broken but he would see there was a fresh application of the blood of the passover lamb and he would forgive he would overlook he would not judge them because of their sin. So when Jesus went into the holy place in heaven and shed his blood, he made an eternal covering over God's broken law. Now, where's God's broken law today? What we learn in the new covenant, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I got the law of God in my heart. You've got the law of God in your mind. But just because I have the law of God in my heart and my mind doesn't mean I still don't fail. Doesn't mean I don't still don't break the law of God. So when I break the law of God, when I fail, when I sin, what does God do? Does he look down from heaven and say, oh, I got my law inside Pastor Coates and look at him. He, he messed up again. He, he's sinning again, even though he's got the law of God. No, he looks down from heaven and what does he see? He sees I'm covered with the blood of Jesus. Come on, get a hold of this. He sees that I'm walking in the righteousness of God by the covering of Jesus over my life. And even though I still fail and even though we still sin, his blood keeps on cleansing and he does not treat us as our sins deserve, but he forgives us and lets his mercy and his grace come upon us because there's now not a temporary It doesn't wash away after a few months and have to be repeated every year. The, the, the blood on the Passover day would dry up. It would, it would, it would uh, deteriorate. And so every year they had to do it all over again. Jesus made a permanent covering of the blood over my life, never having to be repeated again. So the old uh, sanctuary was uh, inferior because it was a type of something greater. Thirdly, It was inaccessible by the people. The average person could never go in there. I mean, only the priests could go into the holy host, a holy place, but only the high priest could go into the holy of holies. I mean, that's where the presence was. That's where the glory was. That's where the Shekinah was. And the only person that ever got to go in there was the high priest. And he could only do that once a year. I mean, all the glory of God is in there, but it's inaccessible to the people. It's unapproachable. But the new covenant, the new sanctuary is filled with the glory of God. On the day that Jesus died, literally, the gospel writers record that the veil in the temple was torn in two. And and God himself like reached down and tore that veil. And it wasn't, torn, the scriptures say very clear, it wasn't torn from the bottom up like man went in there and tried to tear his way in the presence of God. It was torn from the top down as if God himself said, I'm going to open up a freshly slain pathway into the presence of God. And now whosoever will may come and you can approach the throne of grace. Let us come boldly before the throne to approach his throne of grace with mercy and with confidence because we now have a standing in righteousness. And uh, I know that you know this, but let's just celebrate it. Every one of us can get in there anytime we want to. 
You don't have to have somebody else go in there for you. You don't have to have a paid priest go in there for you and pray prayers for you. You pray your own prayers and you go into the presence of God your own self. You go by the blood of Jesus and it's his blood that gives you open access into the presence of God because the old sanctuary was inaccessible to the people. The new one is accessible to the people. Number four, the old one was temporary. It says in verse number eight, by this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy of places is not yet open so long as the first section is still standing. It was temporary, but the new sanctuary, of course, is eternal. The old sanctuary, its ministry was external and not internal. Verses nine and 10. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. What good were they if they couldn't change our conscience? What good were they if they couldn't cover sin? It was ceremonial. It was to cover the ceremonies of the law, but it was never capable of changing the person's heart. That's, you've heard me say this, and I, I like to say things repetitiously so that they're catchy. The Old Testament continually said, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, but never gave man any power to live any differently. It said, thou shalt not commit adultery, but never gave people the power to stop lusting. It said, thou shalt not steal, but never gave us power to stop coveting our neighbor's possession. It said, thou shalt not murder, but never gave mankind power to stop hating his brother. It said, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And even though they made sacrifices and they got ceremonially um, covered from that sin, the sin was still in their heart. The wrong attitudes, the wrong desires, the wrong um, motivations still continued. So that's why through the blood of Jesus, we're not covered from the outside in. We're covered from the inside out because he changes us. And I don't come to church because I have to. I come to church because I want to. I don't love my brother or sister because I can't hate them and that's not allowed. I love them because I'm filled with the love of God and it's inside of me. And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Isn't this great? I'm telling you what, I mean, it makes you so glad every day you're living on this side of the cross. Uh, now that's, you know, let me just pause here. A lot of people would say that, well, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, just grace today. It's grace, grace, grace. And, well, the, the requirements under the new covenant actually are stronger than the requirements under the old covenant. In the old covenant, you, you, you were commanded to bring a tithe. In the new covenant, everything belongs to God. Everything in my life, not just the 10%, but everything about me belongs to God. In the old covenant, he said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus came along and what did he say? Even if you look upon a person and have unrighteous, uh, un, uh, immoral desires in your heart, it's like you've already committed adultery in your heart. The Old Testament said, thou shalt not murder. Jesus come along and said, don't even hate your brother. Don't, don't even speak a, a, a word of a raka or a re, word of rebuke. So, so literally, the, the new covenant is much stronger expectation than the old covenant. A lot of people don't realize that or don't see that. But the great thing about it is, even though it gives us a greater expectation, it also gives us greater power to be able to fulfill those expectations. Because now, Paul said to the Romans... The Holy Spirit has done through the word what the righteous requirements of the law could never accomplish. So we're able to fulfill what God originally intended through the law, but they could never do it by obligation. But now we do it by the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. Everybody doing okay? So then um, what made the new sanctuary... Superior. If the old one was inferior, what made the new one superior? 
Well, just the opposite of all those things. If the old one was an earthly sanctuary, the new one is a heavenly sanctuary. I think I have all five of those. Yeah, the, old, the, the new one is a heavenly sanctuary. If the old one was a type of the reality that was coming, the new one is the reality, not merely a type. If the old one was inaccessible, the new one is accessible. If the old one was temporary, this one is eternal. If the old one's ministry was uh, was just external, then the new ministry is eternal and not external. So we don't have to go through all those because I pretty well uh, went through all of those um, already. So let's go to point number three. Let's look at the furnishings of the, um, uh, of the temple or, or the tabernacle. The first thing that we had was the lampstand. Now, what's the lampstand? The lampstand, you've probably seen, I know you've seen, or familiar with the word, the menorah, a seven-fold candlestick or lampstand. You've seen the, the golden candle adra with one candle in the middle and then um, three on one side, three on the other with seven um, candlesticks or, or lampstands. Uh, lampstand is better rendering probably be because they were not candles like what we think of wax candles they would have been little cups little tulips on the end of these golden tubes and they would have been filled with olive oil so it was not a wax candle but it would have been olive uh, cups that were then ignited with the fire and the olive oil was the uh, fuel that would cause them to burn. So what, what was the purpose of the menorah? What was the purpose of the lampstand? I won't re read there, but Exodus chapter 25 says that it was to provide the necessary light for the priest to accomplish their ministry. No electricity. You couldn't just flip the bill. You know, you didn't just debit with Lacucci and know that you can keep your lights on for the next 30 days. Uh, so if the priests were going to go in there and work, there had to be light in there. And so the lampstand would light the area so they could do ministry. Jesus came along and said what? In John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then when he got ready to go to heaven, he said, what? You are the light of the world. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But uh, he is the light. And now he has shined his light on us. And we have been ignited by the light. And now we are the light. And we are the, just like the uh, moon. You know, the moon is not the sun. You look at the moon in the middle of the night. And the moon looks like it's uh, lit on fire by the sun. It's not. The moon's not on fire. The moon is just merely reflecting the light of the sun, right? You guys have been to science, right? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. So um, we are reflecting the light of Jesus. His light has shined in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, and now we're the light of the world because we're reflecting Jesus in the world. And uh, there's a beautiful analogy from this. I'm going to watch my time. Wow. Wow. Uh, can't do all this, but I do want to do this one. In the book of Revelation, it says that John was exiled on Patmos, and in the spirit on the Lord's day, it says he saw the sevenfold candlestick, Rev Revelation chapter 1, and I saw Jesus walking among the candlesticks. What's that a picture of? That's a picture of Jesus is walking among his church because his church is the light of the world. And in that analogy, I like to point out again, it was not a candle with like a wax, but it was oil, the oil of the olive oils that was in the cups. But in the picture now, the cups are our lives and we're filled with the Holy Spirit. So we're burning the spirit of God that's ignited by the person of Jesus. And what's the interpretation for that? That the church is the light of the world. The church is the light of the world because we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we're burning. The spirit of the living God has ignited us on fire. The fuel is the Holy Spirit. The wind and the air to have 
to have fire, you have to have fuel, you have to have oxygen, and you have to have an ignition point. So the fuel is the Holy Spirit. The uh, ignition point is the, the when we're baptized and we're, we're saved, and then we are oper- the 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 host is us because we're filled with the fire of the Spirit of God. So that's the lampstand. Then there was the table of showbread, and uh, that was a picture of the bread. The, the manna that sustained them and kept them alive during their 40 years of wilderness wanderings. But Jesus, again, turned around John 6 and said what? I am the bread of life. And if a man eats of this bread and drinks of this cup, he will never, he will never hunger, he will never thirst again. So the table of showbread is the picture that Jesus is the bread of life that satisfies. There was the golden altar. The golden altar was where the fire was, and that represents the the fire of God burning in our lives. And I already talked about the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, the Ark of the Covenant, I mentioned, had the the Ten Commandments. It had the Pentateuch. It had the pot of manna. And I don't think I mentioned this one. It also, maybe I did, it had Aaron's rod that budded. They kept all those things, and they kept them inside the Ark of the Covenant. So I know our time's about gone, but just to summarize the whole point here tonight, the tabernacle, the portable sanctuary in the wilderness that then was replaced by the permanent temple, they were pictures and shadows and foretellings of the real sanctuary. The real sanctuary is is not this building. The real sanctuary is the presence of God where Jesus is in heaven, but also how it is reflected in our lives because know you not that you are the temple of the spirit of the living God and his spirit dwells in you. So that gets us up through verse 12. Now, next time we'll pick up verse 13 and just notice what it starts to talk about. For if the blood of goats and of bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ? So what's the key word of our study? Better. Better. So next week, we're going to talk about how the blood of Jesus is better than the blood of the animals. That's, that's where we're going for next week. So tonight, the, we have a better sanctuary. Next week, we'll have a better sacrifice. We've already learned that we have a better covenant. We have a new covenant. And uh, we could go back and trace all the things that we've learned all the way back from chapter number one. Better, better, better. Everything about this new covenant is better than it was in the old covenant.